Good evening, my name is Roxanne Chabot from RBC Consultants. Welcome to our webinar. This evening, we are at our fourth webinar for CASMO, CASMO standing for the Canadian Skin Management and Oncology Group. And we're gonna be sharing with you this evening an algorithm for the management of hormonal therapy related to cutaneous adverse effects in oncology patients. Our speakers this evening is Dr. Joël Claveau, who is a dermato-oncologist at Melanoma and Skin Cancer Clinic, Centre Hospitalier Universitaire de Québec, Hôtel Dieu de Québec in Quebec City. We also have Dr. Charles Lynn, who's the Chief Medical Director of the Lind Institute for Dermatology and Lind Derm Research and Associate Professor, University of Toronto Department of Medicine, as well as Investigator of Property Medical Research in Markham, Ontario. We'd like to thank our supporter this evening, La Roche-Posée Laboratoire Dermatologique, for making this educational event possible. Before we start, a couple of logistic tips. If you're having issues hearing the webinar, you can listen to the presentation using your telephone. Just select phone call in the audio pane and the dialing information will show up. If you're having technical issues or if you would like to submit a question to our faculty, please use the question chat pane on the right hand side of your screen and I wrote you a little note there to see where you need to type in your questions. At the end of this webinar, a survey will pop up in your web browser following the webinar. If you could fill it in for us and send it back to us, we'd truly appreciate it. Also, within one to two days or by the end of the week of the webinar, the recording of this program and a certificate of attendance will be sent to you. Again, please submit your questions using the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen. So without further ado, I will pass the, the floor virtually to Dr. Charles Lind. Thank you very much, uh, Roxanne. And uh, welcome to all our attendees. We've got attendees of oncologists, dermatologists, nurses, uh, family doctors. So many different uh, uh, specialties are, are attending tonight. And tonight's on basically hormonal therapy in relationship to uh, continuous adverse events related to oncology patients. So we're going to go to uh, we're going to go back to a polling question, uh, just as a beginning. So we're going to ask a simple question: uh, Do you actually see cancer patients with skin toxicities? Uh, yes, frequently. Yes, occasionally. Or no, never. And and I think uh, if you answer this honestly, you're going to say, you know, any one of us uh, that are interested tonight, we're seeing a lot of cancer patients. Certainly, we know that cancer is very prevalent in the Canadian population. And by very nature, whatever subspecialty or family doctor, nurses, we're going to be seeing patients. Uh, yeah, so again, about 50% saying uh, yes, very frequently, and some saying, yeah, occasionally. But I think at the end of the talk, you're going to go, oh, I'm probably seeing some of these patients, and I don't really classify them as cancer patients, not really thinking about their skin toxicities, because it's so pervasive. So the, the objectives tonight here are review hormonal therapy related cutaneous adverse events and talk a little bit about the algorithm that we've made about hormonal th uh, therapy related cutaneous adverse events. Uh, Dr. Uh, or Roxanne here has already talked about that TASMA was a, a group of uh, dermatologists, uh, radiation oncologists um, and oncologists that got together and said, you know, we really don't talk a lot about the continuous adverse events that are occurring in all our cancer patients. And we got together and actually have gone through all the different areas, looking at, say, radiation dermatitis. Again, a general overview about skin care for prevention of immunotherapy ones. And tonight in particular, we're talking about hormonal therapy-related ones. And these algorithms and these uh, little sort of uh, reviews that we've done I think are pertinent not only for the patient themselves, but again, physician, nurses, pharmacists, and advanced uh, providers. These have uh, appeared in Skin Therapy Letter, 
this is one of them talking about the role of generally of skin care and oncology of patients. Uh, just recognizing that this is an area that's been under talked about. Uh, we went on to talk about, again, general skin management and skin related toxicities in all the areas. We've created uh, an algorithm surrounding all of this, talking about what you should do before cancer treatment and particularly education. Uh, too often patients are just told that, oh, you're going to get radiation, oh, you're going to get chemotherapy, and they're often not really well prepared for what's going to happen. So it's important often to cleanse, moisturize, protect, particularly from the sun with using an SPF, and techniques around camouflage. And then we basically did uh, different uh, therapies, are there side effects, uh, continue the preventive care, but and we put in the kind of red box things that if you see some of these things with your therapy, fever, skin pain, blisters, mucosal involvement, uh, abnormalities, a high liver function, a decreased uh, creatinine clearance, this is where you should send it to a oncologist, oncology nurse, ER, or a dermatologist. And again, just further in this algorithm talking about uh, in general, ensuring that the skin toxicity is not dangerous or life-threatening, and these are all the different things that would suggest to you that there's a, a red flag, if you would, in terms of the fever, blisters, skin pain, mucosal involvement, and abnormal lab tests. And I think we have been reforming what is being done around acute radiation dermatitis. Uh, for many years, the uh, radiation oncologists basically said, don't wet it, don't do anything to it, just let it scab and crust. And I think the new paradigm is to actually moisturize the area and to prevent as much uh, inflammation as possible. But just basically uh, talking tonight about the hormonal therapy, and we're gonna go on. Uh, Dr. Claveau, who's on the talk tonight, was the major author of this particular uh, section. So I'm gonna pass it to Dr. Claveau. Dr. Claveau's as you know, he's very involved, uh, particularly in melanoma, in the skin cancer clinic in uh, Quebec City. Uh, authored many different uh, papers and is a speaker around this subject. And again, he was one of the kind of key opinion leaders that say, you know, this is a project that's worthwhile. Get the word out there about treating these patients. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of patients have cancer. And I think we've been doing a disservice to them and not being aware of their side effects and treating them and improving their quality of life. Dr. Claveau. Thank you very much, Dr. Lynn, for this uh, great introduction. Thanks for inviting me and thanks to the participant. It's really a, a very uh, a stimulating project and interesting. Thanks to Laraj Posey for supporting that, actually. The more we read about that and we realize uh, cancer patients um, have a, uh, a lot of skin toxicities. It affects a lot their quality of life in many and all types of, of cancer. And really, in, in service, it's up to 40% of uh, 50, 40, 50% of cancer patients that have a decreased quality of life uh, with uh, their cancer. Uh, uh, affected by the skin side effects. So let's go with a small uh, question to start. Which skin toxicity is not frequently associated with hormonal therapies for cancer? Ursulism, hot flashes and flushing, paronychia, alopecia. So the one which is not associated is paronychia, or very rarely. Really, we'll see that uh, the air changes, either too many air, ursidism, or losing hair, like alopecia is frequent, and also hot flashes, flushing, rosacea, is a big concern and problem, both in men and women.
So the outline of the presentation will be first to review the CASMO algorithms we have developed for hormonal therapy as uh, related to cutaneous, uh, cutaneous adverse events, the methods, especially talk about the methods we've used. Um, we will concentrate on uh, three topics. Uh, of course, hormonal cancers, which are, uh, are they, what are they? Uh, they are uh, breast cancer for women and prostate cancer for men. So when we use treatment to block the hormones, we basically uh, uh, provoke a menopause, uh, menopause-like uh, uh, symptoms, and for men, it's andropause. And uh, in both category of those uh, cancer, we can have alopecia. So those are, will be the main chapters in my presentation. So really the aim, as uh, Dr. Lin mentioned, is really to give uh, some tools for uh, every uh, uh, healthcare providers involved in that field and uh, by doing uh, uh, so uh, we will help our patients so a panel of uh, clinicians that treat those patients got together we reviewed the literature and we really uh, try to develop some uh, some uh, guidelines to help us and manage uh, those uh, patients as uh, we said medical oncologists, family practitioner, internal medicine, dermatologists, oncology nurses, pharmacists are involved in the care of those patients. So we really, as the other uh, aspects of uh, cancer, of course, we're using a lot of chemotherapy, nowadays targeted therapy and immunotherapy, but don't forget we're using hormonal therapy for many years. And uh, we, uh, in a modified uh, Delphi method, we really first uh, uh, define the scope of our project, review the literature, uh, we got together to design um, uh, algorithms and also uh, criticize the literature. And uh, we came to a, a consensus uh, to produce this document. So I just, like I just said, hormonal therapy is really for breast and prostate cancer. It's actually um, breast cancer, 25% of all new cancers in female and 20% of cancer in male are uh, prostate cancer. So really uh, very prevalent. Hormonal therapy is given as an adjuvant uh, treatment in those cancer to reduce the level of hormone and then decrease the risk of recurrence. And those treatments are used for many years. So as compared, let's say, to chemotherapy or immunotherapy, often we give for one or two years. Those treatments are given for many uh, years. And even, let's say, for uh, breast cancer, two-thirds of the patient are uh, positive hormonal receptors and would receive treatment like tamoxifen for uh, at least, if deteriorate, for five years. So this is the... All the medication we've used, there's many categories, but we have uh, divided uh, first in breast. So uh, the treatment for breast uh, cancer, or uh, either uh, uh, we uh, stimulate or block the receptors, either we give uh, hormones, and we see that often they give hot flashes and flushing by inducing menopause or vulvovaginal atrophy and alopecia. So in breast cancer, we see that uh, those uh, treatment, aromatase inhibitors, and uh, high dose hormones will give that. For prostate cancer, we're using uh, many ways to block the uh, androgen, either blocking the receptors, either acting at the hypophysis, um, either with LHRH agonist or antagonist, and also we have uh, inhibitors of androgen uh, production, and again, the side effects are often hot flashes, flushing, and rashes. Let's concentrate on breast cancer. So actually, when we review the literature, we see there's a lot of uh, paper on the quality of lives of patients with uh, uh, breast cancer, many side effects. Of course, there's uh, uh, various side effects of treatment, like uh, you say, like, oh, osteoporosis and uh, 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 respiratory side effects but really if you look at the various side effects skin 
is probably the most frequent and you see in that uh, publication is up to 16% of the patient having skin toxicities. In breast cancer, it can uh, you can have the diagnosis very early, between uh, 18 and 44, middle age, up uh, in breast cancer later on, and you see all across uh, the age, this uh, cutaneous side effect varies from 14 to 20 percent, and uh, even uh, early after the diagnosis, and even late, you see we have late sequela of uh, uh, skin toxicities. The main manifestation of menopause are flushing, alopecia, xerosis with keratoderma, and ursetism. So even just menopause, regular menopause, not uh, only uh, produced by hormonal treatment, um, often is a topic we don't talk a lot in dermatology. There's many side effects, of course, on the, on the uh, uh, genitals. Uh, also on the external genitals, the air, and uh, the skin. If we see in, the, in this uh, paper all the skin manifestation of estrogen deficiency of menopause, you see dry skin and itchy skin, of course, increased wrinkles, generalized hair loss, and for some uh, special uh, sites like the face, hirsutism, up to 30% of women. very frequent skin flushing we tend to forget about that we have a lot of flushing and uh, cuprose in the rosacea but menopause is accompanied by flushing and in the treatment uh, for breast cancer it's often the case and another side effect is dry skin with the extreme keratoderma climactericum i'll show you some pictures of that so here we have example of flushing on the face and on the chest on the left side, you see the lady, she also presents papules of rosacea. <clears throat> Vulvovaginal atrophy. <clears throat> Dry skin, you can have all across the body, but it's very frequent on the eels, fissure and cracks. We need to treat frequently, moisturizer, efficient moisturizer, avoid trauma, etc. This is a publication that uh, was uh, done uh, by many uh, good colleagues in dermatology, including Dr. Lin, where we have an algorithms for management of dry skin. Of course, can be associated with ichthyosis, psoriasis, eczema can affect the total body, the face, hands, and feet. And we see that there's various uh, topical products we can use as moisturizer. Often we can use urea, glycolic acid, lactic acid. Before we go to prostate cancer, in breast cancer, a lot of patients are being treated by tamoxifen. And Apart the side effects we just mentioned, flushing and dry skin, a lot of other side effects have been reported with tamoxifen. You see a big list here, even like Stephen Johnson, vasculitis, recall radiation dermatitis, morbiliform eruption, even lupus. Not to forget, flushing way up there is the most frequent side effect. Can happen uh, for many weeks to months but also other side effects. This is rare, but this has been described as a pseudo uh, lupus presentation in patients with tamoxifen, the classic malar rash. Going to prostate cancer. So as I mentioned at the beginning, prostate cancer, we can treat at various uh, levels. The main goal, of course, is to decrease the effect on androgen that will uh, increase the risk of recurrence of prostate cancer and control if it's metastatic. So we can play at the pituitary level, and we can play at the adrenal level and at the testis. 
where we block the synthesis of androgen. So we're not going to go in detail for every treatment used for prostate cancer, but basically in prostate cancer, we want to induce uh, andropause. As I mentioned, we can use LHRS agonism, I often use Lupron and Zoladex, treatment that I've used a lot. And new categories, the opposite, we can use um, LHRS antagonism, where we have a treatment, Firmagon, now it's, it's an injection, a, 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 a brand a new treatment that will give a lot of skin side effect. And in the category of androgen uh, receptors, we have apalutamine. It often it's not a first line treatment, maybe a, a treatment used uh, less frequently, let's say, than uh, Casodex and other flutamide, but giving a lot of skin side effects. So you see, we have many different drugs acting at different levels in prostate cancer, all of them inducing andropause, but some specifically can have other, uh, can have other skin rashes, eruptions. Again, male andropause, skin alteration and decrease of body hair are the main cutaneous side effects. Of course, decreased libido, um, another problem. So skin manifestation of andropause, flushing, alopecia, xerosis, very similar to uh, menopause. More specifically, and this new drug called apalutamide, I wanted to talk about that. I spoke with my prostate cancer uh, colleagues and they say, Joel, this new drug is very promising, but we see a lot of skin rashes. Maculopapular eruption can be severe in that case, even going to papulovesicular on the right. And even a few cases of AGEP have been described. Uh, you see uh, postals. It's rare, patients are sick, so it's rare, but we have to be uh, aware as dermatologists that we can have a spectrum of skin manifestation of hormonal. Of course, the main one I mentioned, alopecia, uh, uh, flushing, but more rarely uh, other rashes like this. Finally, as I mentioned and I've shown you, there's many drugs used uh, to treat um, hormonal cancers. And there's a big list of uh, medication that can give alopecia. Alopecia is a big concern for patients in can with cancer. It's a big effect on quality of life, of course, more in women than men. And you see here a listing of all the medication used in, uh, as hormonal therapy that can give alopecia. So as we mentioned, tamoxifen, um, other uh, selective estrogen receptor modulators, aromatase inhibitors can give alopecia, LHRH agonism, antiandrogen used in uh, prostate cancer, as I mentioned, progestational uh, agent also give alopecia and acne. This is classic androgenetic alopecia either in a male pattern or female pattern. So this is the summary of the side effects we have with hormonal therapy. And Dr. Lin is gonna, uh, now trying uh, to give us some hints and uh, advice how to manage those side effects. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you very much, Dr. Claveau. Uh, so Dr. Claveau has very nicely shown you the basic uh, categories that we identified in our literature search and the modified Delphi and everything else. And then we went on to kind of review the, all the different treatments and create a, an algorithm surrounding all this. So my uh, part here will be sort of the management of these hormonal therapy related cutaneous adverse events that we've just identified. Uh, polling question, uh, do you feel comfortable managing skin manifestations that have menopause and andropause? And again, yes, very comfortable, somewhat, uh, not really. So uh, Dr. Laveau has identified some of these. How do you feel hey, if somebody come in tomorrow morning and uh, flushing because of uh, their treatment for the cancer of the prostate? Can you, do you feel that you're comfortable in doing this somewhat or not really?
Okay, so there, there's some that say, yeah, I'm pretty comfortable, but I guess they're on the line hoping to, maybe there's some little tidbits here that might be useful. Um, most people are somewhat, uh, but obviously you're trying to be even better. And some are quite honest and go, nope, I'm not quite certain what I'm doing. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Okay, this is uh, the one and it said in fine print and everything else, and, but it basically is what I'm gonna go over, kind of the general uh, menopause, andropause, and the symptoms that you see there in terms of hot flashes, uh, flushing, um, also skin specific things of uh, uh, vaginal and uh, sort of skin atrophy, cirrhosis, and each of these. Uh, androgenic alopecia, rosacea, uh, hirsutism, uh, and others, which we've uh, kind of talked about and identified there. So this was a team effort, and I think that's the important thing when you're managing a cancer patient. It should be a team effort. Um, each of us are having a different input into this, and what we're trying to do is obviously create best uh, results in terms of their cancer, but also providing the best uh, uh, thing in terms of their quality of life. And again, you know, when skin concerns arise, patients are likely to contact their family doctor. Uh, and a lot of family doctors can look after the preventive measures, uh, treatment recommendations, and then the more severe cases uh, be sent on to an oncology nurse, an oncologist, or a dermatologist as necessary. And again, most uh, skin reactions associated with the hormonal therapy for breast and prostate cancer are not life-threatening. So oftentimes the providers, the oncologists and that, oh, these are minor, they're cosmetic things, but they certainly affect the patient's quality of life. And in fact, patients say uh, almost 70% of those in the hormonally treated ones that it's affecting their limiting and affecting their daily activities. And so knowing what they're getting into, you know, that they are going to potentially have flushing. They are potentially going to have hirsutism. They are going to potentially have alopecia. All of these are important things to talk about before they even go on it. I think it's important to educate the patients in terms of other things, in terms of the need for a daily skin regimen around uh, gentle cleansers, moisturizers, and skin protection. Uh, and again, to uh, help you do that. And again, ways of making them feel better. And again, just overall, for all cancers, 80% of the patients experience side effects. So it isn't just one or two people presenting with side effects, and particularly some of the new immune-related uh, uh, drugs cause a lot of side effects. And so you're going to see, we've already identified that there are a lot of side effects associated with hormonal uh, therapies. So just Gen general skincare products to use and not use. So you want them to use a mild cleanser. It should be fragrance free. It should have a mildly acidic or balanced uh, to less than neutral pH, somewhere between four and 6.5. They should be using a broad spectrum uh, sunscreen, SPF at least 30. Most dermatologists are recommending 50. And moisturizers that have emollients or occlusives. They should stay away from things that are abrasive to their skin, that have fragrances, and are alkaline. It's quite amazing. There are still quite a number of products on the market that are alkaline. These dry the skin, they cause irritation to the skin, and can further worsen the patient's quality of life. So hot flashes, we'll start with this one. As you can see, there are quite a number of different uh, uh, ones that can be used here. Um, I my go-tos are, are citalopram for the particular, or escalopram, and somewhere in the dose of uh, 10 to 20 milligrams per day. Those are kind of my preferred ones, but you can use other ones here. Uh, some of the others may interfere with, uh, uh, like um, peroxetine interferes with uh, uh, cytochrome uh, 2D6, and uh, you must avoid its use with tamoxifen. So. Again, just remembering the uh, citalopram and escalopram, probably worthwhile. Uh, some people respond to using uh, gabapentin and uh, preglobentin. Uh, these are often things. Uh, sometimes anticholinergics can be useful, such as oxybutynin. And again, antihypertensive low dose 
clonidine, about 1.1 milligrams per day can be used. And each of these can also be used in people that uh, don't have cancer and aren't being treated with these things, uh, sometimes with uh, bad rosaceas. These are something you might have in your pocket that uh, can be beneficial in that respect also. Uh, sleep disturbances, uh, gabapentin uh, can be used. Uh, and so sometimes I see patients that are having difficulty. Uh, I also use uh, gabapentin sometimes in some of the other areas of things that I deal with that, uh, uh, such as uh, atopic dermatitis, uh, this sometimes can be useful, uh, a low dose again of uh, gabapentin. Hyperhidrosis for a lot of people can be a problem. Um, because remember, you're inducing a menopause in a female and andropause for a male. Uh, my go-to here for the most cases uh, is uh, oxybutynin, actually. On the chart, it's listed as a second line, but oxybutynin in, in a low dose uh, can be beneficial. Remember, it's an anticholinergic, so that, in fact, you sometimes can get um, uh, a little bit of uh, problems with uh, abdominal upset. Um, sometimes you overdry them, uh, but they certainly can be uh, beneficial. And again, remember women in particular, uh, oftentimes people forget to talk about that uh, vaginal atrophy is a, a problem. So again, uh, hormonal free vaginal lubricants, um, water-based gel can be often useful for these people as again, improving quality of life. Uh, back to hyperhidrosis, I sometimes do use uh, uh, Botox, again, neurotoxins uh, for some of the cases. Uh, and you can use a, an old-fashioned treatment, aluminum chloride. Um, the commercial name is called Drysol. It's a 20% solution, be useful for some of the areas. Uh, use too much of that, though, you often dry the skin and irritate the skin. Uh, obviously, in terms of dermatologists, uh, we uh, deal a lot with uh, facial atrophy. It's very important to... Uh, suggest a sunscreen. As I mentioned, SPF at least 30, preferably 50. Uh, always using a moisturizer on the face. And again, cirrhosis, uh, directing them to uh, ones that often have a little bit of uh, hyaluronic acid on it or glycerin uh, to moisturize their skin so that it doesn't become too dry. Okay, so rosacea is not uncommon in both in uh, for males and females uh, in relation to hormonal therapy. And the treatment is basically the same as if you had a regular rosacea patient. Uh, you can use uh, azelaic acid, uh, metronidazole, um, bromotidine, uh, again, can be used. Uh, second line, uh, one that I tend to use a lot of is ivermectin uh, that can be useful. Um, there are some cases, in general, we don't use a lot of benzoyl peroxides with rosacea patients, but in some cases it can be useful. And certainly using doxycycline, again, in a dose of about 100 milligrams a day, is anti-inflammatory and can be beneficial for a lot of patients. And again, hirsutism. So again, you know, I can see where an oncologist may say, oh, you know, it's just a little extra hair. Uh, but this is often affecting uh, the femininity of a uh, female. And so, again, you can get waxing electrolysis. More and more people are going to using lasers, uh, and this can be beneficial. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the uh, system does not pay for laser therapy. This is a self-pay for patients. But there's also a cream called efflorotine uh, topical that they can use uh, twice a day, and this takes down a lot of the growth. And certainly using spironolactone also in a dose usually of 50 to 100. And then the people that are maybe a little bit heavier, you might even have to go to 200 milligrams a day to uh, try to settle this down. Uh, we often here at our clinic use uh, spironolactone in association with laser therapy to get the best result. So basically, you know, patients receiving cancer treatment uh, and uh, our survivors, they live longer. Uh, particularly, as uh, Dr. Claveau has mentioned, many of them on, are on these hormonal uh, therapies that uh, go on much longer, over many years. Often, uh, tamoxifen is used uh, five to ten years. Uh, they need to know what uh, these things and be able to go to someone that can handle them. And for the most part, I think many of these things can be looked after at the level of a 
family physician or nurse practitioner and contribute to optimal care in these people. Uh, the algorithm really provides some of these information about some of these things and the toxicity. And again, all of us should be better equipped to manage these cutaneous adverse events and improve quality of life in our patients. So that uh, enters and finishes the kind of didactic part. Uh, Dr. Claveau and I are quite happy to, because we would think that you must have some questions around this area uh, that may be of benefit, and we're here to help you in that regard. Uh, so Roxanne, again, can you give us any questions? Yep. Again, please submit your questions using the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen, and if you think of any questions after this webinar, you can always send them to info at rbcconsultants.com. We'd like to thank again our supporter, La Roche-Posée Laboratoire Dermatologique, for making this educational event possible. So we do have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, the first question is, knowing that you're going to use a drug that may induce menopause and menopause, are there method methods to prevent alopecia? Um, do you want me to, I'll take it first, uh, Joel. Uh, sure. So again, educating them that unfortunately this is part of the uh, therapy that they're re receiving, and this is almost most likely to occur. Uh, letting them know that uh, many um, women, in particular, are quite concerned about losing their hair. Um, one of the things that I often uh, give people is uh, a topical minoxidil, either making it up in a five percent solution or getting them to buy the 5% minoxidil uh, foam is one of the things you can do. Using a mild uh, shampoo that's not going to irritate their scalp. Uh, letting them know that they probably shouldn't be kind of dyeing their hair as much. Uh, going to get uh, commercial uh, hairdressing uh, products uh, that may be a little bit harsher, that may induce some uh, hair loss, are things they should certainly think about. I also uh, tell people that it might be useful using oral minoxidil in a, in a low dose. Typically for women, it's a 1.25 milligrams per day. In males, it's, we usually use 2.5, and you can go higher with that if necessary. Uh, Joel, do you have any other tips? I think a good tip is um, uh, to talk about it with the patient uh, uh, before uh, they're concerned about that. Um, we know the fear of losing hair with chemotherapy, but when it's hormonal therapy, it's more subtle and uh, gentle. I think, it, as you mentioned very well, it's good to tell them they can uh, wash their hair because often they have the myth of not washing the hair and they think they're going to lose more. And it's not the case. Of course, avoid uh, too harsh uh, treatment, of course, but I mean, I think it's well known that we don't want to stop washing the hair and there is some shampoos that are promoting their effect on helping to prevent hair loss. The studies are not so well done but may help but I, I think minoxidil is a better option as mentioned. Um, the other question is, is it androgenetic alopecia or ethylogen? effluvium sort of alopecia? In that case, I would I think it's androgenetic because we were playing on the hormones. <clears throat> Telogen effluvium more in the case of a patient with chemotherapy. Uh, what do you think, uh, Chuck? Yeah, I, I'd agree. I mean, it's a primarily androgenic alopecia, but um, having dealt with uh, hair loss for like 40 years plus, <laughs> uh, it's complex. Um, so I think there's often... Uh, other things at the same time. Uh, telogen effluvium is like a shedding reaction, and I am quite concerned that a number of people not only have the underlying androgenic alopecia, but sometimes are losing hair because of a telogen effluvium. I tend to look to make sure that I'm not missing a low iron or a low zinc. Um, some of these people are low in vitamin D also. Uh, replacing any one of those can be of some benefit too but I think it's primarily the androgenic alopecia that you're uh, gonna go after and try to improve. Unless you are at the time a uh, big stress of the initial diagnosis and the surgery, of course, then you will have some uh, telogen effluvium. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, if you have anesthetic, that can give you some uh, telogen effluvium early on too. Yeah, excellent question. But the air uh, concern is big, and uh, it's often one of the first thing that comes up for women when they, you're asking them about their concern for their treatment. Yeah, it needs to be addressed and educated. Uh, is it okay to use spironolactone in a patient who is on tamoxifen? Joel, do you want to take that one? We have addressed that. We discussed in our panel, and we said the literature is not uh, uh, clear on uh, re uh, recommending to avoid that. So we think uh, it may be used, but um, is it what you uh, got from our discussion? Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I think it is. Uh, there's nothing uh, warning in the uh, literature about that. However, I must admit, I would probably use oral minoxidil first, uh, and so that I'm not being accused of causing something else, manipulating their hormones in any way, and decreasing their potential to get the best result from the um, anti-hormonal or the hormonal therapy that we might be using. Yeah, and, and uh, that we always talk to the... A surgical oncologists or medical oncologists to have their opinion and uh, decide as a group. I think this one point you mentioned very well. In in, in those um, situation, more and more we're working as a team. The cancer clinics are built like that. Actually, we we call pods. We are actually working at the same time, seeing the patient with medical oncologists and surgeon, and it's great for the patients. Um, what do you find best for generalized hyperhidrosis? So the uh, go-to one that I go to is uh, oxybutynin, uh, low dose. Uh, it's 2.5 milligrams. Um, that is the um, uh, the pill. Um, I usually start slow, uh, so that I uh, often use 2.5 milligrams uh, twice a day, and then you titrate it up. And so because I mentioned dry mouth, dry eyes, uh, upset stomach, nausea can occur with this drug. Um, so I usually have them do that for a week, twice a day. And then if everything's fine, the next week they go up to taking it um, uh, three times a day. Uh, it depends upon, it's weight-based, if you would, somewhat from the point of view. You know, a person that's uh, 250 kilograms uh, needs a higher dose. They often need uh, somewhere around six or eight a day. You have a small woman that is uh, uh, 55 uh, kilograms or something. Uh, she can often get used to uh, just uh, twice a day or three times a day. So titrate it up and down. It's a drug that's hard to get, though. Not every pharmacy has it on their shelves, and you often have to go to a specialty pharmacy to try to find that for them. Joel, do you have a go-to drug? No, it's where we see the, we don't have so many of those. I think it's really more like the localized hyperhidrosis is a big problem. And uh, as you mentioned, the topical treatment and um, uh, Botox is being used more and more. It's covered uh, in Quebec uh, with uh, special indication. Um, and uh, it's, it's difficult to find doctors that do the palms and soles. Often it's easier to do in the axillary or uh, the groin. And um, there is some uh, new uh, treatments coming up in the laser field, but I don't have a lot of experience in those. And particularly oh. men and women, obviously, are quite bothered at this. They, uh, you know, all their girlfriends talk about, uh, you know, how their uh, menopause uh, made them want to go out in the uh, Canadian snow naked oh. and go in the snow. Uh, men uh, don't normally, and their male friends don't go, oh, you know, I feel uh, flushed all the time. Um, so it's something that you have to explain to men. It's very similar to menopause that happens in women that's been induced by their therapy for their prostate cancer. Uh, what are your thoughts on the JAK inhibitors for alopecia, risk versus reward? I think there's a, still a concern for JAK inhibitors in cancer patients, so I would doubt uh, that we will use this uh, for alopecia, especially it's alopecia areata, the indications coming up. Yeah, I think this, uh, I agree with Joel, uh, there's a little bit of clouding 
uh, around the JAX and uh, possible cancer risk. Um, and you already have a patient that you've identified as having a cancer. Um, and the JAKs have been primarily been shown to be useful for um, alopecia areata. Uh, there aren't any studies that have suggested that they're going to be great for androgenic alopecia. And it's androgenic alopecia that we're dealing with here, not alopecia areata. So I, I don't think they're going to be the go-to drugs, because first of all, I don't think they're going to work. And then there's some safety concerns. Um, also, what is your go-to drug for flushing? I, I think I answered that in the uh, little chart there, uh, using the um, escalofram uh, type of thing. There were two there, uh, low dose, uh, 10 milligrams to 20 milligrams a day um, are the ones that I tend to use. I, I, it's not, we didn't actually put it in the chart and I'm not sure why, but I use low dose uh, propanolol too in some people, much like I use low dose propanolol for some of my uh, flushing with rosacea patients um, that can be potentially used too. Thanks again, I like rosacea, it's always important to reiterate the importance of avoiding uh, triggering factors. Uh, we repeat that all the time, like spicy foods and changing of uh, heat to cold, uh, Sauna going to cold now it's very popular to go in a spa and you have a warm bath switching to cold bath trying to avoid that and of course sun protection with SPS uh, 50 and above UVA UVB coverage. And Joel, what do our patients say? Those are all the things I like to do. You're asking <laughs> me to give up. You're asking me to decrease my quality of life by doing those things, but uh, yeah. So I usually uh, conjure them. And if they're having you know 10 cups of coffee a day, got to get back to one or two and make it lukewarm. Uh, again, if they really like their alcohol, again, maybe hopefully getting them cut back to what the Canadian guidelines say, <laughs> two drinks a week. Uh, mm -hmm. It's important. Uh, they, they can modify their life. Uh, oftentimes, they don't particularly want to, though. Um So would you suggest, I don't know if you mentioned this, would you suggest topical glycopyrrolate for hyperhidrosis? Yeah, so yes, the problem with that is that available on the sheet in the United States in sheets, um, uh, we don't have that in Canada. You can go through uh, your um, compounding pharmacist and that can sometimes be beneficial. Uh, but for the most part, we're dealing a lot with generalized uh, hyperhidrosis or more localized ones that can often be uh, beneficial by using the uh, aluminum chloride or even potentially the Botox. Uh, so the answer is yes, it's just hard to access it, and that would end up being self-pay too. Yeah, that's hopefully it's going to become available in Canada soon, maybe. What is the best treatment for keratoderma climactericum? Oh, you, show, you showed that? Why don't you take that one, Joel? Yeah, but I, I think the first thing we, uh, we see with the patient with this, they often use like a, a brush or like a pounce, or like a, a pierre pounce in the stone, yeah, to, to try to... Uh, remove that and I think it's even worse because traumatized and you increase the response so the first gentle care uh, moisturizer it's not the uh, usual moisturizer usually we need to use something with urea or lactic acid I think uh, you need to uh, try even to go for higher uh, concentration of urea not easy not easy and uh, encourage the patient to use frequently because it's very uh, difficult problem. I would really treat with other than topicals. Yeah, you often have to use about, um, you can get by with lower amounts of urea, but there are, you can get 20%, 22% urea. Uh, Clusion, I think is an important thing. Uh, I use uh, saran wrap, uh, but you can just put it on and have them put their sock on at night to uh, clude some of it, but saran wrap's even better. Uh, and some of these people can get very deep fissures and uh, 
we, I think uh, myself and many other dermatologists use crazy glue uh, to, or flexible collodion to paint in the uh, fissures. Because if you've got a really deep fissure, you, you can't walk. You're, it's uh, really very painful to uh, walk. And so providing uh, advice surrounding this is very important. And this is good. I mean, people get the uh, keratodermas uh, as they age anyway. But certainly there seems to be much more of this cirrhosis surrounding the uh, treatments with uh, inducing men menopause and andropause. Yeah. Good shoes. And, sorry. I was going to add also, like we've said, preventive measure. Make sure uh, using good shoes uh, because it's also the friction uh, contribute. And even getting them to, as we were mentioned, preventive measures in the first place, getting them to use the uh, moisturizer, uh, molient, um, even before they start the treatment. And our last question is a bit off topic, but it's from our good friend, Dr. Marty Gidden. So what are your favorite topicals barrier creams for adiodermatitis? Well, regular barrier cream is full. Yeah, so I, I use a fair amount of, uh, of Aquaphor, um, Cicoplast, I, I like Cicoplast too, I'm saying trade names here. Um, there are quite a number of different ones. Um, one of my mentors uh, used to always say the best uh, moisturizer is the one that the patient likes and will use. And uh, Marty, you know who that was, that was Neil Shear, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Always a good trick to give a few samples and ask the patient to try. Uh. Well, that concludes our webinar for this evening. We'd like to thank uh, Dr. Joël Claveau and Dr. Lynn for such a useful and compelling presentations uh, for all the healthcare professionals, really, that take care of cancer patients. And we'd like to thank you all for joining us this evening. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Merci. Thank you very much. Yep. See you, Joel. Take care. Bye bye, Roxanne. Bye now. Merci. To RBC for the great support. Thank you.